Hi, welcome to Embry Hills, and I'm Angelo Martinez. And I'm Austin, and we have questions. Where have you seen God at Embry Hills? Well, <clears throat> for me, where I've seen God at Embry Hills is through some of the programs that we do, especially Reconciling Ministries. I think that it's important that um, the breadth, breadth of our um, spirituality and the depth of our love is not defined by the rules of our religion. And I think that goes back to how I view God and how I see you know, Jesus during his time. So I think that's a big part of how I see God at, at Embry Hills. And what has been your most powerful experience at Embry Hills? I think our most powerful experience was um, through Snack Sacks because there was one week where we decorated the bags and then we um, came in to pack them. And then that week, Addie saw three of her classmates at school get the bags. And for her, it clicked. And then that clicked for me that we're making an impact on our community and we're living out what Jesus has us to do through a every week service and not just a one time a year check in a box. For everyone watching, what would you like them to know about Embry Hills? That we are non-judgmental, we're open, we are um, welcoming and inclusive of all people, and we're not what you think of as a church in the sense that we're judging people and we have rules and we're religion-based. We are open-minded, and that's really important to us. How do you feel Embry Hills has uh, contributed to your personal growth? For me, and I think for us, we have a very intelligent congregation, intelligent staff, and they make us ask ourselves deep questions about our religion, and I think that's um, how I've grown the most after being here for 12 years. What are some ways Embry Hills has shown you love? Uh, through the children's programming, I think that what Embry Hills does for children and children's ministries um, shows a lot of love to the community, a lot of love to our neighborhood and to our neighbors. What are three words you would use to describe Embry Hills? Loving um, careful and um, generous. I think uh, one word I describe Embry Hills is talented. I think we have a lot of talented people on our staff, Dottie, Pastor, Susan, and um, that's just two people that's in front of me right now, so I can name <laughs> a lot of people. But I think everyone here is very talented in their own way. And it really adds a lot to our congregation and to our family, our church family. And I would say open-minded. <laughs> Do you have a question for Miss Susanna? <laughs> Without a mouthful of spaghetti? Ask her, mm -hmm. ask her that question. This was kind of weird. Did Adam like, did Adam like grow up or did he just be? Did God just make him from the dust as a man? You know how to answer that? Let us know. Please. Thanks. That is an excellent question. Um, I will say that there are two um, creation stories in our Bible. Um, one talks about Adam and Eve, and one doesn't mention people at all. And they're both in the Bible, and so there's more than one version of the stories that we made to think about what the beginning of things might be like. Um, also, when these stories were written down, they didn't have any science like we have science. They had ideas about how things worked, but they didn't, um, they didn't know that the earth was round. They didn't know about evolution. And so they made stories that made sense with their world at the time and the way they understood it. So we think about these stories now with a whole lot more information. We know about evolution. We know that the earth is um, round and it goes around the sun. They didn't know any of that but they knew how humans worked and they knew how important um, God and humans together were. And so they made stories that looked like that. So 
you can think about, there's more than one story of how that went, and you can think about what you think a better version of the story would be. Think about what you know about God, think about what you know about people, and do you think it would be a better story if Adam just showed up all of a sudden, or if Adam had to grow up? And how would that change the story? Would one have, um, would one be a better version of the story than the other? And I'm curious about what you think, because um, we are all still wondering together. So there's not one way that we can go, like look in the Bible, it says right here, Adam was 27 years old when he showed up in this garden. Um, it's a lot more complicated than that, and it's, an, it's a very old story, and there's more than one version of it in Christianity, and there's more than one version of it all over the world. And so you get to add to it what you think about people, and what you think about God, and you get to wonder, um, and that helps the story stay alive and still be meaningful um, after all this time. And so my favorite part of the story is that Adam has life breathed into him with God's breath. And so every time I breathe in and out, I remember that our breath has to do with God. And so that's why we always um, breathe right before we pray and we talk to God. So which one do you think would be better story? Fully formed 27 year old Adam or an Adam toddler? Cause I think most versions of the story would have a benefit. And I'm curious about what you think. Keep asking questions, keep sending to them to me. Cause I love this. I'll talk to you later. Bye. What you said makes total sense. And and yes, you may put it on time on the steps. And what's your... Thank you. Which, thank which you version for answering. do you like? Um, I don't know. Let's think. I didn't think this. I would think... Well, I don't know what I would think. But if it was a better... If I did think, I have both reasons for why I would think. So I would think... I would think the younger version, him as a toddler, than growing up. That might be a better version because there's more experience in his life. He knows all about everything. He knows all about the garden. So, like, that would make sense because he knows where the trees are. He knows where everything is. But um, the other one would make sense, too, because, like, in Bible stories, they never show, they don't show his background, as you said, you know, in different stories. They don't mention people at all. But in the one that they do, I've read it um, sometimes at school when we do Bible. And they said, um, well, I just lost my train of thought. That's okay. Oh, right. They said, like, they said, like, he came from something. I forgot. I for he came from the dust. So, um, actually, now I think the better answer is the one when he was gro all grown up. Started all growing up? And did you know that Eve, Eve, um, she was made from Adam's core? Like, Adam had oh. another core, and then she just grew. Eve. That's what it said <laughs> in the Bible story. Oh. How about I say thank you, Miss Susan? Yeah. Thank you. Our scripture for today is Exodus 17, 1 through 7, Water from the Rock. From the wilderness of sin, the whole congregation of the Israelites journeyed by stages as the Lord commanded. They camped at Rephidim, but there was no water for the people to drink. The people quarreled with Moses and said, Give us water to drink. Moses said to them, Why do you quarrel with me? Why do you test the Lord? But the people thirsted there for water, and the people complained against Moses and said, why did you bring us out of Egypt to kill us and our children and livestock with thirst? So Moses cried out to the Lord, What shall I do with these people? They are almost ready to stone me. The Lord said to Moses, Go ahead of the people and take some of the elders of Israel with you. Take in your hand the staff with which you struck the Nile and go. I will be standing there in front of you on the rock at Horeb. Strike the rock and water will come out of it so that the people may drink. Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. He called the place Massa and Meribah because the Israelites quarreled and tested the Lord, saying, Is the Lord among us or not? The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. What happens when things don't turn out 
like you expect. 81 days ago, I had this experience, and, and if you're like me, you're tempted to complain and to question. I did a lot of questioning. I didn't do a lot of complaining because I've learned over the years there is no need to complain, at least for me in my case, because when I complain, nobody listens to me. And so I've learned to kind of keep my complaining to myself. Many of you prayed for me during this time. You might remember or recall that I was having health issues. I had a test at Mayo and uh, in July, and it came back saying that my kidney function uh, was uh, deteriorating. I thought at the time that the numbers that the doctors showed me uh, were sure signs of rejection. Having had this experience uh, before in 2008 of rejecting the kidney, I was on heightened alert. I was worried. I was afraid. I had to schedule a biopsy at Mayo in August. Once I went through the biopsy of the transplanted kidney, I got the good news and shared it with you that there were no signs of rejection whatsoever. The remedy for my cure was to adjust my medication and increase my hydration. And so I went out and bought one of these and I drink about four, three or four of these a day to keep my kidney hydrated. Perhaps you never experience dehydration. Do you know the signs of dehydration? Where you find yourself not remembering how many times you've gone to the bathroom to do number one? And then when you finally do do number one, you notice that it's darker than usual? Sometimes you have dryness of mouth or sometimes you have halitosis or, or where I come from you have bad breath and your breath stink. Or perhaps you get tired or, or you get confused. These are sure signs of dehydration. When I was going through my struggles back in the summer, it was as if my body began to complain, not by verbally saying something, but by acting out with symptoms. It was trying to get my attention. My kidney numbers had increased and that meant that my kidney function was decreasing. And so I did begin to question, God, after all we've been through together after the second transplant, why did you bring me this far only to have my second transplanted kidney to fail? God, I got too much ahead of me. You promised that you will do these things for me. You promised that you would lead me, that you would care for me. And yet, it feels as if I am in a desert with no water, no thirst, no relief, and no support from God. Ever felt that? Well, if you have, then I would suggest that you're in good company. Because in our biblical text for today, it was 75 days where Israel found itself. They had just experienced the parting of the Red Sea. And a chapter earlier, Exodus 16, God had provided manna and quail to satisfy their hunger from complaining. And it's just a couple of weeks later, and guess what? They're at it again, just like you and I. Sometimes we get short-sighted, and when we thirst, we complain. When we hunger, we complain. The Israelites have just left the wilderness of sin and they made camp at a place called Rephidim. It is interesting to me that the name actually of Rephidim actually means a place of refreshment, a place of support, a place to prop oneself up. Now, why is that name significant as I read the text, as we think about what this text means for us today? Simply this, it was God who was leading them by a cloud in the daytime and a pillar of fire at night. 
And wherever the cloud went, the congregation, the people, the, the children of Israel followed. And when the cloud stopped, they stopped. And so God is stopping the people in a place called Rephidim. And I don't know about you, but I guess if I were one of those Israelites, I would have a fundamental assumption going on in the back of my mind. And the hotter it got, I would begin to complain too. You would think, so the story goes from the Israelites, that if Moses was leading them in the wilderness, that the leader would know where the water holes were where the springs were, where the places that they could refresh themselves, not only for themselves and their families, but their livestock as well, because it was not just a handful of people following uh, the cloud. It was the entire community. And so they complain at the place where God stopped them to give them support, to give them refreshment. Seems to me, that they were dehydrated, both physically and spiritually. What happens when we're spiritually dehydrated? In our biblical text, the people began to complain against Moses and, and they began to turn on Moses. In fact, the thirst was so significant that they were going to stone Moses or at least that's what Moses thought. And so Moses goes in and cries out to God, what do you want me to do with these people? And God gives Moses the remedy. God tells Moses to go in front of the people. Take elders with you. Perhaps he's taking them for protection because after all, he's afraid these people are going to stone him. Or perhaps he's taken these elders as witnesses because they were elected from the different tribes and they would be the one to go back and give an eyewitness report of what was about to happen. And God told Moses to strike the rock at Rephidim. The rock at Mount Sinai, and that rock would gush open to quench their thirst and to stop them from complaining. You know, this story is so ancient and so old, and yet there's relevance to us today. You see, I don't know about you, but this past Sunday was the first time that I actually got out of my house on Sunday to attend a drive in church. Before then, it had been almost over six to se almost seven months since I physically went to church. I've enjoyed watching our churches worship online during the uh, virtual platform. I've been able to do at least three or four, sometimes five a Sunday if they're pre-recorded. But I have to tell you, nothing beats being in person. And so this wilderness experience of this pandemic is causing me as well as all of us to question, when is this going to be over? When will things go back to normal? When will we be able to get back into the church and have our normal routines? When can we worship in person in the church building? When, God? When? How, God? Where? God, are you with us? You know, it seems to me that in this time period, we're all been tested like the wilderness experience, a pandemic like the coronavirus or COVID-19, basically either accelerates or exposes the issues and the struggles that we were having pre-pandemic. And so if we had some discomfort before, now we experience disruption. 
If we had some uncertainty before, now we experience downright confusion. If we've had issues where we didn't uh, know, but we went along with it, and now the things that we went along with are no longer at our disposal. And so we're uncertain, we're tired, we complain. God, we're thirsty. Did you bring us in this pandemic, did you bring us this far not to be able to give us water? And it seems to me that all of our questioning, all of our complaining in our difficult place is right in line with the Israelites. And Moses complains to God about the complaining, but God seems to be used to it by now. And the good news for me is even in my personal situation where things don't turn out like I expect and I complain and I question God, God is still there. God listens to my complaint, knowing that I'm spiritually dehydrated, that I'm parched, that I'm dried up, that I don't know what to do. And so I lean on my own understanding. I lean on my own self-sufficiency. I lean on taking care of the old De La Soul rap song, me, myself, and I. And I strike out against anyone that will listen. And I want to look for a magic stick that will remedy my suggestion, a, a remedy my illness. Perhaps there is a magic pill that I could take, perhaps a couple of, of prescriptions to help things get better. Long as I can go back to what I'm used to, I will be okay. And yet, like the Israelites, God leads me to refine them. Where is God leading you in this pandemic? Where do you find places of refreshment and support where you need propping up, where you need a time out to, to begin to reorient yourself, to begin to drink from the well, or like me, you drink from your bubba, where you refresh your thirst, you refocus. God leads us by a cloud and day and a pillar of fire by night. Maybe it's hard for us to see, but there's still clouds out there. And maybe those clouds for you now are dark clouds. We've experienced some storms. We continue to pray for folks who have suffered from Hurricane Sally, and, and now we're in the Greek alphabet of hurricanes. And it seems like 2020 is one of those years where everything that can go wrong does go wrong. And yet, God still is with us at Rephidim. Will we trust God or our own self-interest? How might we be God's people? How might we bring comfort to those who are suffering loss? How might we reorient ourselves to hear the complaints? Because the complaints are simply that things don't are not working out and we need remedy. My friends, those of us in our pews, those of us that are in our chairs, those of us that are in our pajamas, those of us that are watching and listening, we have the answer. And it's not a magic stick, but it's through God, our trust and our faith. May we find refreshment. May we be refreshment and support for those who are struggling. Perhaps there's a friend or a family member that you haven't talked to. I encourage you to reach out to them. Call them. FaceTime them. Yeah, I know it's difficult because we don't like watching flat screens, but Zoom them. And in, if all else fail, write them a card, a handwritten card. 
Yeah, I know there's difficulty when we're in the shopping car, in the shopping center, or we're in the grocery store, and uh, people don't practice social distancing, particularly for me because I'm one of those people who are immunocompromised, and 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 I have to be honest. There are times where I'm tested. There are times where I'm having internal conversation. In fact, my my, my halo drops a little lower than my horns, and and if I'm not careful, my horns will protrude out. Or maybe you're nothing like that. But perhaps your spiritual dehydration shows up on the social media platform where you're tempted to do what I call throwing a rock and then hiding your hand. You know, just making a blind comment and, and, and not considering that there's another person on the other end of the screen. Oh, my friends... We need spiritual refreshment because we are dehydrated. And as God continues to be with the children of Israel, God will continue to be with us. And my prayer is that during this week, that God will continue to walk in front of you to lead you. May God be behind you to keep you from straying. May Almighty God hover above you to protect you. And during the times of this week when you're challenged and you find yourself complaining, my prayer is that God will drop underneath you to support you because the weight is too heavy for you. And finally, it is my prayer that God will walk beside you because of the promise never, ever to leave you. We are in a wilderness experience. We're in times of uncertainty and unknown. But God is with us. My prayer is that we will trust God for our nourishment to quench our thirst. Those who have ears, let them hear. Have you ever walked through a burning, dusty desert Where the sun beats down and scorches your soul? And have you ever knelt and prayed to God for mercy? Cause you don't know how much farther you can go Well, there's a place of rest just over that horizon When I'm tired and thirsty, that's where I go All I really need taste of that refreshing from the spring of life where living water flows I'm going back to the source of living water that abundant supply will never run dry when I get to feeling dry and thirsty down in my soul I just go back to where the living water flows Life, sometimes we get discouraged And I start to wonder if I've lost my way Did I make the right decision at the crossroads? Or should I take the road that's better paved? Well, then I hear the sound of cool, clear, rushing water Like a mountain stream running right through my soul and I know that every mile will be rewarded By the cup of living water that I hold I'm going back to the source of living water That abundant supply will never run dry When I get to feeling dry and thirsty Down in my soul I just go back to where the living water flows Abundant supply will never run dry When I 
get to feeling dry and thirsty down in my soul. I just go back to where the living water flows. God in Christ, we thank you for your guidance, for your manna in our wilderness hunger, for having made it through another week. Some of us are emerging out of a literal wilderness of sin, or out of illness, or broken relationships, or out of substance abuse, and we are parched for water and for direction. We still remain in a wild place of pandemic and political conflict and wondering who in the land has that powerful staff that parted the water on our Freedom Way. Who can bring water now out of a rock for our dry throats? Lord, are you among us or not? We believe that you are, but still help us with our unbelief. Help us move beyond depending on our political leaders for direction and leadership. Help us depend on you who provides the living water and wisdom and power and presence. Give us courage to live and learn, to love and to serve, to fight evil and injustice. In Christ Jesus, Forgive our complaining, ignore our fear. We really are grateful. We really are hopeful. Write your words upon our hearts in whatever condition we find ourselves and go with us and be our shelter in the storm. Be the ground of our being and the light that no darkness can overcome. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. And this is a please receive this benediction. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift his countenance upon you and give you peace. Thank you for worshiping with us at Embry Hills United Methodist Church. I'm Victoria Stoddard, the director of Serve Team and Youth Ministries. I wanted to share a little bit more about ways you can get involved in events at the church. As always, we encourage you to look at the weekly source that has all of the extra details and any links that are necessary for any of our announcements and the things we don't even have time to mention. If you don't receive our weekly source, I encourage you to go to our website, embryhillsumc.org, and subscribe there. Also, you have the opportunity to subscribe to Kids Town and Youth Ministries weekly communications there as well. This week, I want to remind you that we're still in phase one, so social gatherings of a limited number outside are now part of our regathering process. The main kicker is that you just need to reserve through Laura, stay safe, wear masks, stay distanced and keep attendance. So go through Laura Briscoe in the front office, front office, and she will get you going on that. Also, I know you're seeing the Halloween decorations out there and even the Christmas ones, but at least Kids Town and Youth Ministries are ready for Halloween. So Youth Ministries will be doing a do-it-yourself trick or canning for snack sacks for kids. That'll be October 18th and 25th and more details will be out soon. And Kids Town is going to join in supporting Snack Sacks with their family fun event on October 25th called Mask Our Aid. Mask Our Aid. Masquerade. So you get to show off your costumes, be safe and distanced, and play games, support Snack Sacks, get some candy. Sounds good to me. So just sign up through the link for signup.com or contact Susanna Bales directly to get the information for the time and the place and anything else that is necessary for that event. We hope that all of you, as we move from September into October, 
are doing well and staying healthy. Hope that you will worship with Embry Hills again next week. <laughs>